This is a follow-on video to two earlier videos I made about um, the effect of cross-polarization jamming against missile seekers, which use an antenna similar to the uh, that used in the Ukrainian Neptune uh, missile. In other words, a flat plate array which is circularly polarized. And in part two of that video, of those videos, I, I've mentioned a paper I found from 20, published in 2023 out of South Korea, in which the authors describe something called a semi-dual polarized seeker antenna. Uh, it's really the feed that goes on a reflector, but that's the type of antenna it is. And among the various benefits mentioned by the authors is resistance to cross-polarization jamming. So, even though I might be the only person who's interested in this, I decided to make a video about it. And the, the question is, were the authors successful? Is this antenna type immune to or highly resistant to cross-polarization jamming? So I had a look at that. And cutting to the chase, in my opinion, the answer is no. They were not successful. The antenna is still susceptible to cross-polarization jamming with some caveats. And this is the... This is what I found. This is a video, a short video, but what I found. Anyway, the design of the semi-dual polarized antenna is so interesting and so well documented in the paper that about a year and a half ago, I decided to add it to Engage. So now it's part of the Antenna Design Assist application in Engage. Now, recapping, the antenna is a reflector with a compound feed where the feed is five waveguide aperture antennas. The center antenna, the center aperture, is circularly polarized and it's used to form the monopole sum pattern and of the apertures in the waveguide feed, it's the only one that transmits. To the left and right of the center feed are azimuth difference feeds, which are waveguides oriented for horizontal polarization. Above and below the center feed are the elevation difference feeds, which are open-ended waveguides also, and these are vertically polarized. And again, the difference antennas they're used and receive only, they don't radiate. Now, it's not surprising that the azimuth and elevation difference patterns would have orthogonal polarizations because it allows the two phase centers to be of, the, of the, uh, these waveguides to be as close together as possible. And that couldn't happen if both channels had the same polarization. Just because linear polarization waveguide cross-sections are rectangular. The phase center separation is important because it determines the beam squint angles of the monopulse difference pattern, which determines the angle tracking sensitivity. So you can't just put the, the difference antennas, if their phase centers are far, as far apart as you want it. It's a really important parameter. By the way, here's the effect of moving the feet off the focus. The beam moves in the opposite direction. Now the difference pattern is formed by moving two feeds off the focus in opposite directions. And in a normal monopulse antenna, the sum pattern is formed by a coherent addition of those two difference beams. That's not how the semi-dual pole antenna sum pattern is formed, but it is how the difference pattern is formed. Now remember that what we're looking at here is the feed design for a reflector antenna. So this little group of antennas goes at the focus of a paraboloidal reflector and the result is a monopulse antenna that could be used in a missile seeker or other applications. Now it's clever what the designers are trying to do. Uh, to the outside world, the seeker looks like it's circularly polarized because it only transmits on the, the sum channel. But the azimuth and elevation difference patterns are linearly polarized, so they can be formed just fine by using only the vertical or horizontal components of the circularly polarized skin echo. So will cross-pole jamming work against this type of antenna? Well, I've never tried it in real life, but my opinion is yes, with conditions. Each of the three channels are separately jammable. A circularly polarized jammer will, or able to do arbitrary elliptical polarizations, uh, will jam, could be used to jam the sum pattern, and a linearly polarized jammer can be used to jam either of the difference patterns. So let's talk about the center element for a minute. On the input side, the square waveguide is just two garden variety side-by-side -side rectangular guides the height is half the width, uh, and each is excited by a coaxial probe that creates a TE10 mode in the guide. And notice that the, the coaxial probe arrangements are mirrors of each other on either side. And by, by the way, TE10 mode is shorthand notation for how uh, the electromagnetic wave propagates down the guide, where TE stands for transverse electric. If you understand that, what that means, great. If you don't, it doesn't really matter. Um, anyway, the two guides are separated by a four-section septum 
polarizer that converts the TE10 mode in the rectangular guide, one of the rectangular guides, into TE10 and TE01 modes in the square guide with a 90 degree phase shift between them at the radiating face. So that produces right hand circular polarization from one input, rectangular guide, uh, and left hand circular polarization from the other because the coaxial probe in the guide in the, is in the mirror position of the probe on the other guide. And if you excite both probes coherently at the same time, then in principle you get nothing out since in a perfect world, left hand circular polarization cancels right hand circular. Uh, but if we built the feed, interestingly, thought experiment, if we built the, the feed into the real world and both ports were excited, then the amount of cancellation would depend on boresight, would depend on the physical symmetry of the real world construction and assembly of the, of the parts, how, how well you could put it together. And that would de determine the achieved boresight polarization isolation. So it's kind of a throwaway thought experiment. So if the jammer engages the seeker with a modulated reverse sense elliptical polarizations, then the sum pattern will be the distorted, will be distorted in, in the usual way uh, for cross-pole jamming. Uh, but the difference patterns will have their copolar shapes. Now I expect there's probably very little interest in this video, so I'll end it here. But for the likely three people who are interested and can follow, I'll make another video that shows what I see happening if the uh, three channels are jammed separately, the sum channel, azimuth difference channel, and elevation difference channel. They can be jammed separately. And as a teaser in this final little part, here's what I see happening if, for example, the sum channel is jammed. Um, that's maybe the most obvious choice because it's the only one of the three that transmits. Uh, that's visible to a jammer. Um, but it's not the only choice. We could jam the azimuth or elevation difference channels even though we can't see what their polarization is. And uh, I think that's worth talking about all by itself. Uh, what an intelligent jammer would be able to deduce from the uh, uh, effect that it sees, deduces, that the jamming is having by watching what the seeker is doing. So here is an Engage Map Track Points application showing triangular polarization modulation. And this application is described in two earlier videos. Here are the links. So here's the map of the azimuth track plane points for this jamming the sum channel. And here is a servo loop simulation for triangular polarization modulation. The seeker antenna is driven promptly into the side lobe region. And here's what happens if the polarization modulation is positive sawtooth. The result is similar but different. And here's what happens if the polarization is a negative sawtooth, and it's basically the same deal. So I'll continue in a, in a fourth video.